Okay, so today we are going to talk about the technological singularity explained and promoted. And so um, you can play the song on your own. And uh, so the objectives to understand that uh, one should not fear complexity, do not seek the one great truth. There are many truths and they can be simultaneously true, true concurrently. Understand the three main schools of belief about the singularity, four main paths to the singularity, the history of the singularity, Marcus Hutter's main ideas about it. Understand the challenge of promoting the singularity, the idea behind Future Day and Longevity Day. So first, do not fear complexity. There's beauty in complexity. Your significant other is complex. Uh, the real world is complex. So perfect uh, quadruple think with equipoise. So double think um, is a concept you're probably familiar with, taking two conflicting ideas and accepting them both, but uh, complete um, completely accepting the world as it is almost in, in includes doing that with four conflicting ideas right, rather than two. And you may wonder about this word equipoise. It may seem to you like everybody around the world who uses that word, but when talking about ethical things, it's a quintessentially Canadian word. So other people when with ethical discussions don't use that word in other parts of the world. So we can be very proud of equipoise. So seemingly contradictory ideas can all be true. One can find balance between them. For instance, the future of transplantation is promotion of deceased donor donation, till there are no waiting lists, tolerance, tissue engineering repair, stem cell creation, new organs, a whole panoply of different things will, will lead to success ra rather than just one forward plan, one plan for moving forward. Peter Diamandis, the um, co-chancellor of Singularity University says, when faced with a choice between two desirable goals, choose both. It's not always possible. So I've been trying to find metaphors that are sort of cross-cultural and most people know about Alice in Wonderland. No matter what culture you're from, you've probably encountered Alice in Wonderland. So the world in Alice in Wonderland is a world that's much more organic than expected. For instance, in playing Flamingo, the main difficulty Alice had was in managing her, in playing croquet, in, in managing her flamingo. So like the ball was alive, the mallet was alive, everything was alive and biological where you wouldn't expect that. So we face a world that could be exactly the opposite of that. In the technological singularity, we face a world that could be much less organic than expected and could develop without us. You know, uh, tech leader Bill Joy was gonna write a book about this stuff and he got all, all the books together and when he, he discovered that the future might not need us, he, he, he decided not, not to write the book. But anyway, that, that's something that we need to kind of confront and be aware of. So there are three main schools of belief about the singularity, accelerating change, event horizon, and intelligence explosion. And then four main paths, ways to get there. Create an artificial intelligence that exceeds human intelligence. 
build human computer interfaces that allow humans to go beyond their innate intelligence to a significant extent, so called cybernetic singularity. Number three, find ways in biology to improve upon natural human intellect. We ordinarily think that that would be quite slow, but maybe things could be discovered that would speed it up. And finally, the internet or the, inter, the, the, the idea of, of the internet coming alive. You turn on the computer one morning, <laughs> the internet starts speaking to you in an authoritative voice. Build large computer networks which are beyond human, in which beyond human intelligence emerges. All these different variations of belief in the singularity are reflected in the courses at uh, Singularity University. And I came to create this course after attending the executive course there. So it had a pretty potent influence on me. The experience of attending Singularity University is one that grows and grows after completion of the course and the associated memories become more vivid rather than less vivid with time. They're on an exponential curve of their own. Some people have said the same thing about this course. You'll have to see whether that's your experience with, with the course. So in 2010, as I said last time, I became the only full-time university faculty member taking this Singularity Ex University Executive course. And there I met Ray Kurzweil, and uh, he is the Chancellor of Singularity University, has been honored by seven US presidents, and uh, a really impressive guy from childhood on up. Um, and his views and intellectual exploration of this area are as broad as that of the university he founded. So occasionally, <laughs> here at a late night party or something, hear somebody criticizing him as if he had rigid views. But he spent over a decade full time answering people's questions about this stuff. So if he is reachable. You, you can write to him and pose questions yourself. And if you do that, he will respond and he'll probably teach you something you didn't know before because he, he, he has dealt with the question you're posing for a lot longer than you have and, and has additional insights in, into it. Uh, so now I'm going to start uh, presenting to you uh, Marcus Hutter's slides. If you've already looked at those slides, these are like the same slides, but they're a bit brighter. And maybe I, I'm, I'm a bit more uh, optimistic and, you know, ebullient than <laughs> Marcus Hutter is. But anyway, they're Marcus Hutter's slides. But this is only half of the lecture. And then the second half of the lecture is really upbeat and happy and with all sorts of colorful and fun things. So anyway, I don't want you to get too deeply depressed. It's Start and remember that Jonathan Schaefer said this is the most difficult PowerPoint for students to understand he has ever seen, and he doesn't even know how I am brave enough to show it in the course. And it is true sometimes, like I noticed students starting sh shaking their head toward the end. But anyway, no one has actually left the room or anything, and then about that time we we change to the second part of the lecture. Okay, so the history here. In 1847, R. Thornton, the editor of the Expounder of Primitive Christianity, wrote about the frequent, the recent invention of the four-function mechanical calculator. Such machines by which the scholar may, by turning a crank, grind out the solution of a problem without the fatigue of mental application would, by its introduction into schools, do incalculable injury. But who knows that such machines 
when brought to greater perfection, may not think of a plan to remedy all their own defects, and then grind out ideas beyond the ken of mortal minds. So there you have it. 1847, already the idea of machines becoming smarter than we are and rapidly self-improving. The idea of the technological singularity. And in 1863, four years after Darwin published on Origin of the Species, Samuel Butler published a letter captioned, Darwin Among the Machines. It compares human evolution to machine evolution, prophesizing half in jest that machines would eventually replace man in the supremacy of the earth. In the course of the ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. The letter raises many of the themes now being debated by proponents of the technological singularity. In Erewhon, which you all recognize is nowhere backwards, Butler argued that there is no security against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness in the fact of machines possessing little consciousness now. A mollusk has not much consciousness. Reflect upon the extraordinary advance which machines have made during the last few hundred years and note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. The more highly organized machines are creatures not so much of yesterday as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with past time. Okay, so just a little bit about Marcus Hutter. Um, he has done a um, presentation on slide set called Can Intelligence Explode? And that's what this is. And he has done um, combined uh, PowerPoint with audio, and I've sent you that link. Um, and he did teach uh, University of Alberta students directly once. And not only did he not enjoy it, but he insisted that the video of that be deleted from <laughs> every device on which it exists. And so there would be no electronic record of this unfortunate direct encounter. And he's the only lecturer we've ever had who has not enjoyed interacting with you guys. Uh, so he really marches to the beat of a different drummer. So <clears throat> the history then of the technological singularity, the more recent history goes back to the mathematician Stanislaw Ulam, I.J. Good, Ray Solomonoff, and Werner Vinge, who is also a science fiction author, still around, still active. And its widespread popularization was um, brought about by Ray Kurzweil, who wrote uh, three books, 1999, 2005, and 2012. And the later books, are all responding to criticism of the first book. So it, it's, it's like he has devoted his life to responding to critics. And that's the main thing that keeps him going. Um, and then there are, are events, uh, Singularity Summit, uh, Singularity Institute and University. And, uh, um, about uh, eight years ago, the Singularity University went beneficial, non, uh, beneficial for profit. So you may know that in California, some other US states, you can be a for profit corporation that's dedicated to doing good for the human race. So that's what they became. And they decided to like buy up all the other entities with the word singularity in them. So we, we became one of the few entities out there that are not part of Singularity University. 
Famous philosopher David Chalmers has also um, um, made statements about the singularity and as one of the references for this slide set. And then there is Marcus Hutter. Okay, so Moore's Law, you all already know about this. It's an exponential curve. Um, machine performance uh, doubles about every 18 months, and, and this has been going on for a long time and is not dependent upon any one technology. Um, so that's Moore's Law. So superintelligence by Moore's law, uh, computation doubles every 1.5 years, now valid for 50 years. As long as there is demand for more computation, Moore's law could continue to hold for many more decades before computronium is reached. Now, computronium has traditionally been on the midterm. And it's not a term that any other course is going to use. So it's something you're supposed to know about. Where what that means is the whole universe is sort of turned into um, uh, computerized resources, that, that everything is of computers. That is computronium. And in 20 to 30 years, the raw computing power of a single computer will reach um, 10 to the 15th to 10 to the 16th flops per second. And the computational capacity of the human brain at 10 to the 15th to 10 to the 16th flops per second. So computers will be equal in intellect to individual humans. Um, it's now thought that that will occur a lot sooner, within the next nine years. Some conjecture. Software will not lag far behind. Um, and this will be the consequence of acute general intelligence, uh, uh, artificial general intelligence, or re reverse engineering or simulating the human brain. So. Anyway, no matter how, how you look at it, uh, human level AI in like 15 to 30 years. So sorry, before we move on, I think Joel had a question. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I, I'm just, uh, what, I'm not sure what a flop is, a flop per second. I never heard of that before. I just like you to clarify what that is. <laughs> Aha, well, you're assuming that I know. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is a computing term for like a, a, a single cycle of, 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 you know, computing action. Uh, I, I, I can't precisely define it. That's, that's a very good question. But um, so it, it starts with the idea that the human brain and computers are doing the same thing, right? And what is the smallest um, uh, component of that thing that they're doing, right? And, and so that's what a flop is. But um, we'd have, have to look at more to see exactly. Well, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, okay. So acceleration or doubling patterns. Um, so you can imagine that in the hunter-gatherer Stone Age era, uh, things didn't double very quickly. We were kind of on a, a, a linear trajectory there for a long time. Um, and then agriculture. Um, many of you probably think things got better with agriculture. But there was greater disparity in human status, right? So it got, got better for the owners of things and not necessarily for the people work, working the land. Then the Industrial Revolution. So, so anyway, during the, the, the pre-industrial agricultural age, 
there was doubling every 900 years in the hunter gathering age doubling every 250,000 years in the industrial revolution doubling of things like what computers do every 15 years and then the computer dominated uh, era every 1.5 years you could imagine <coughs> when there is superhuman intelligence that uh, that intelligence will double monthly or more quickly than that. Uh, this is a Kurzweil um, diagram showing these various epochs, the epoch of physics and chemistry and then biology and then brains, and then technology and merger of technology and human intelligence. And finally, the universe wakes up. Now, this may also bother Joel because it's not quite clear what would that mean, the university wakes up, the universe wakes up. But it's kind of like Computronium is everywhere and like everything is connected to computers everywhere you look in the night sky, you know, not just here. Um, and uh, so this general idea, when, when, when you watch Jonathan White's TEDx talk, and you know you're responsible for the second half of it in the course, right? So it also ends sort of talking about this, that, that uh, you know, that uh, uh, computation uh, expands to fulfill the whole time-space continuum and all, all that kind of stuff. So maybe hard for you to really believe that that could be something, but it's a part of these people's concept. Is the singularity negotiable? Can we stop it? Is, is, is it, you know, it, is there anything we can do to slow this thing down? And basically Hunter says no. But anyway, the appearance of augmented a AI or AI smarter than we are is like the ignition of the detonation cord toward the singularity, the point of no return. Maybe the singularity is already now unavoidable. And politically, it is very difficult but not impossible to resist technology or market forces. It will be similarly difficult to prevent artificial general intelligence research and even more so to prevent the, the development of faster computers. Whether we are before, at, or beyond the point of no return, is also philosophically intricate, as it depends upon how much free will one attributes to people and society. And it's a little bit like politics and the inevitability of global warming, or like a spaceship close to an event horizon of a black hole. You might, in principle, escape the black hole, but is doomed in practice because it doesn't. It has limited propulsion and can't get away from the black hole. So basically, it's a long, complicated slide that says we're going there. There's no tur turning back. This is happening, and it's happening in your lifetime. OK, so this is the slide where Marcus Hutter got really upset at how <laughs> limited my uh, intellect was and that that of my students that we couldn't quite grasp this so keep that in mind <laughs> i go through the slide some information analogies inside process resembles a radiating black hole observed from the outside maximally compressed information is indistinguishable from random noise too much information collapses and equals zero, zero information. 
So the idea of the Library of Babel is it would contain all possible books, not only properly printed books, but books with blank pages and books printed backwards and books printed in languages nobody speaks and all, all that kind of thing. And because a library of all books would be too large to be indexed, it basically contains no information. So that's a paradox for you. <laughs> having all information equals having no information. Maybe a society of increasing intelligence will become increasingly indistinguishable from noise from when viewed from the outside. And you know that an, an exam question is, what does Marcus Hutter believe the singularity will sound like? And the answer to that is white noise. So if you're not speeding up and watching another group of people who are speeding up in this uh, singularity um, uh, intelligence explosion, their activities will seem like white noise to you. Comparison. Each way, outsiders cannot witness a true in intelligence singularity. And inside, it's, it's also hard to know that you're in one. Expansion inward, outward usually follows the way of least resistance. So in other words, uh, would this use a lot of external resources or be something mainly internal that can't be seen. Outward explosion will stop when all accessible convertible matter has been used up. Historically, mankind has always been outward exploring. Just in recent times, it's become more inward exploring, as in miniaturization and virtual reality. Conclusion then, strict, in, strict intelligence singularity is neither experienced by the insiders, the people going through it, nor by the outsiders. Neither one of them can accurately really take in what's going on. Assuming recording technology does not break down, then the singularity seems more interesting for outsiders than for insiders. If you're in the inside, it you're just living through the societal changes and, and uh, you may not really know that this is happening. While I, outsiders more passively observe them. What is intelligence? There have been many definitions, but Marcus Hutter thinks he has the best ones. <laughs> this would be his favorite slide in the slide set, I think. There are numerous attempts to define intelligence. Leg and Hutter uh, in 2007 provided a collection of 70 plus definitions by individual, individual researchers as well as collective attempts. If or since intelligence is not just speed of computation or speed of thinking, what is it then? And what will super intelligences actually do? So evolution and evolving intelligence. Evolution is a combination of mutation, recombination, selection increases intelligence if useful for survival and procreation. In animals, higher intelligence via some correlated practical cognitive capacity increases the chance of survival and number of offspring. But in humans, that isn't so. Intelligence is now co positively correlated with power or economic success, but actually negatively with the number of children. And if you think of bacteria, for instance, they are not very smart, but very good at increasing their numbers. So obviously, reproductive success is not really a sign of intellect. Memetics, genetic evolution has been largely replaced by memes and uh, memetic evolution. The replication, variation, selection, and spreading of ideas causing cultural evolution. 
So which activities are intelligent and which activities does evolution select for? Self-preservation, self-replication, spreading, colonizing the universe, creating a faster, better, higher intelligences, learning as much as possible, understanding the universe, maximizing power over men and organizations, transformation of matter into computronium, maximum self-sufficiency, the search for the meaning of life. Intelligence kind of equals rationality, but not completely, and reasoning toward a goal. More flexible notion of what intelligence is, is uh, expected utility maximization and cumulative lifetime reward maximization. But who provides the rewards and how? In animals, one can explain a lot of behavior as attempts to maximize rewards, that is pleasure and minimize pain. Humans seem to exhibit astonishing flexibility in choosing their goals and passions, especially during childhood. And so it's not always a calculated thing. It's, it's based on whim and stuff like that. And robots you, you can, and machines, you, they are rewarded by the teacher or hardwired to be seeking certain rewards or stimuli. Goal-oriented behavior often appears to be at odds with long-term pleasure maximization. So that's kind of a part of growing up, right? <laughs> so dealing with, with that. Still, the evolved biological goals and desires to survive, procreate, parent, spread, dominate, are seldom disowned. Evolving goals, initialization, who sets the goal for superintelligences and how? Anyway, ultimately, we will lose control. The AGIs themselves will build further AGIs if they're motivated to do so. And this will gain its own dynamic. Some aspects of this might be independent of the initial goal structure and predictor. Evolving goals and process. Assume that the initial virtual world is a society of cooperating competing agents. There will be competition over limited computational resources. And those virtual agents which have the goal to acquire them will naturally be more successful in this endeavor compared to those with different goals. The success of virtual agents will spread in various ways and others, the successful virtuals will spread and others will perish. The end result then of these evolving goals, soon their society will consist mainly of virtuals whose goal is to compete over resources successful, successfully. Hostility will be only limited if this is in the virtuals best interest. For instance, current society has replaced war mostly by economic competition since modern weaponry makes most wars a loss for both sides, while economic competition is in most, most cases benefits at least the better. <clears throat> the goal to survive and spread, whatever amount of resources are available, they will quickly be used up and become scarce. So in any world inhabited by multiple individuals, evolutionary and economic-like forces will breed virtuals with the goal to acquire as much computing resource as possible. Virtuals will like to fight over resources and the winners will enjoy it. <laughs> the losers will hate it. In such evolutionary virtual worlds, the ability to survive and replicate is a key trait of intelligence. But this is not a sufficient characterization of intelligence. Bacteria are successful in this endeavor too, but not very intelligent. What about alternative societies? So 
so global cooperation with no hostile competition likely requires a powerful single virtual world government and to give up individual privacy to severely limit individual freedom, sort of like as in anthills or beehives, or requires societal setup that can only produce conforming individuals. Like we talked briefly last time about breeding humans that are radiation resistant. Um, yeah, so things, it, it's quite shocking really to think about going from the complete chance, uh, you know, event of, of the genetic combining that makes humans today and think of doing it in a much more directed way. Might only be possible by severely limiting individuals' creativity like flocks of sheep or schools of fish. Monistic virtual worlds, such well-regulated societies might better be viewed as a single organism or collective mind, or maybe the virtual world is inhabited from the outset by a single individual. Both virtual worlds could look quite different and more peaceful or dystopian than the traditional ones created by evolution. But that doesn't mean they would be fun, right? They would just look peaceful, uh, more peaceful or dystopian. Intelligence would have to be defined quite differently in such virtual worlds. The adaptiveness of, of intelligence, another important aspect of intelligent, intelligence, how flexible or adaptive an individual is, Deep Blue might be the best chess player on earth, but is unable to do anything else. On the contrary, higher animals and humans have remarkably broad capabilities and can perform well in a wide variety of environments. So the formal intelligence measure then, intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a wide variety of environments. Leg and Hutter, 2007. Informal definition implicitly captures most, if not all traits of rational intelligence, such as reasoning, creativity, generalization, pattern recognition, problem solving, memorization, planning, learning, self-preservation, and many others. Has been rigorously formalized in mathematical terms and properties are it's non-anthropocentric, um, wide-ranging, general, unbiased, fundamental, objective, complete, and universal. It's the most comprehensive formal definition of intelligence thus far. What about copying and modifying virtual structures? Copying virtual stru structures should as, be as cheap and effortless as it is for software data today. The only cost is developing the structures in the first place and the memory to store and the computation to run them. Cheap manipulation and experimentation and copying of virtual life itself is possible. So in other words, mind uploading, once you've uploaded your mind to a non-biological substrate, you could make as many copies as you want. Um, virtual explosion with life becoming much more diverse. In addition, virtual lives could be simulated in different speeds with speeders experiencing slower societal progress than laggards. Designed intelligences will fill economic niches. Our current society already relies on specialists with many years of training. So it's natural to go to the next step to ease this process by designing our descendants, designer babies. The value of life. Another consequence should be that life becomes less valuable. Our society values life and since life is 
a valuable commodity and expensive laborious <laughs> to replace, produce, raise. We value our own life since evolution selects only organisms that value their life. Our human moral code mainly mimics this with cultural differences and some excesses. If life becomes cheap, motivation to value it will decline. Abundance lowers value. Analogies, cheap machines decrease the value of physical labor. Some expert knowledge was replaced by handwritten documents, then printed books, and finally electronic files. Each transition reduced the value of the same information. Digital computers made human computers obsolete. And in games, we value our own virtual life and that of our components less than real life because games can be reset and one can be resurrected. So the consequence of cheap life, governments will stop paying my salary when they can get the same research output from a digital version of me essentially for free. And why not participate in a dangerous fun activity if in the worst case, I have to activate a backup copy of myself from yesterday, which just missed out this one, anyway, not very well going day. <laughs> and the belief in immortality can alter behavior drastically. So the value of virtual life, countless implications, ethical, political, economic, medical, cultural, humanitarian, religious, and art, warfare, etc. Much of our life is driven by the fact that we value human individual life. If virtual life is or becomes cheap, these drives will ultimately vanish and be replaced by other goals. If artificial intelligences can be easily created, the value of an intelligent individual will be much lower and the value of a human life today. So it may be ethically acceptable to freeze, duplicate, slow down, modify, or even kill uh, oneself or other AIs at will. If they are abundant or backups are available, just as we are used to doing with software. So laws preventing experimentation with intelligences for moral reasons may not emerge. With so little value assigned to individual life, maybe it becomes a disposable. <clears throat> Are there universal values? Are there any universal values or qualities we want to see or that should survive? What do we mean by we? All humans or the dominant species or government? The time the question is asked, could it be diversity or friendly artificial intelligence? Could the long-term survival of at least one conscious species that appreciates its surrounding universe be a universal value? Okay, so anyway, that's the end of that slide set and now this is the lowest ebb that your your emotions will ever feel in this course <laughs> we've gradually brought you down now we're going to raise your spirits again uh, by talking about what may seem to you like you you may know in my office there's a picture of uh, don quixote jousting against wind windmills right idea of fighting a sort of fruitless battle. And you may feel like this about Future Day, which I'm about to describe, because the number of people interested in, in, a, in the world was very small in the beginning, but has been consistently going down. And so now there are like two cities in the world celebrating Future Day, Edmonton and S Sydney, uh, Sydney, Australia, and Anyway, it's still worth talking about. It's a, a traditional part of this course. What about longevity? Well, there's something interesting and in medical there. The life, life expectancy of uh, Canadians, of course, has been going up, but has leveled off because of uh, 
opioid related deaths. So, so I mean, that's kind of shocking to think about. Um, and uh, so there, there, there is much more interest in longevity in just about every other country. It, it's not clear why there is less interest in Canada, but that is the case. <clears throat> so that, uh, so it, uh, the proposal would be that in the fall, we celebrate uh, Longevity Day, November 1st, and in the spring and winter, we celebrate Future Day, March 1st. So our first celebration of Future Day, in March 1st, 2012. And there is Joel Crichton in, in, in the center, and we still have that banner. And uh, yeah, anyway, so that's... So that first Future Day, there were 16 celebrations around the world, a lot of different places, Melbourne, Sydney, Hong Kong, Berkeley, Edmonton. You can read the list, even in Poland. So what is Future Day? Yeah, well, <laughs> so it is a celebration of the future, and I'm going to describe if we're going to take something that looks like an unsuccessful holiday and make it into a successful holiday, what would be required? So that's re really what we're talking about the rest of this lecture. Uh, so one idea we had had in Edmonton that we've never actually manifested is an event at the Art Gallery of Alberta, uh, where you have a like like an MC and all these people generating ideas all, all around. So the Edmonton Salon, comparable to the Paris Salon of a century ago, you're probably familiar with, where all these artists and writers got together, was remarkably productive. How much that benefited the human race came out of the Paris Salon. And so our, our, our proposal was that we could do something similar in uh, Edmonton at the art gallery. <clears throat> and so I've been making the, this pitch to students for quite a while. These are students, I think, from 2014. Anyway, you, you can help us decide how important, or if it's important at all, this, this initiative is, and how we can make a success of it. So <clears throat> what is the potential to reach people with the ideas in this course? So the Big Bang Theory has been a remarkably successful television program, and the science that it talks about is the same as the science we talk about in this course, they do it with humor and uh, excellent acting. I guess some of the highest paid actors <laughs> are on that program. Uh, we, we, we do it with ordinary human beings. And so anyway, there's a remarkable difference between, they, they even have a specific episode you can watch that deals specifically with the technological Singularity from October 1st, 2010, and Woz, the so co-founder uh, of Apple Computing, that is a uh, guest on that. Yeah, so you, you, you and I, as I talked about la last time, they reach maybe 100 million people, and we're reaching about 6,000, so it seems like we could be doing better, right? So... So anyway, but it would need visual identity too. And you're probably aware of, of like things in Canada, color me red, but they basically mimic what goes on in, in the, uh, the Asian subcontinent of, of this uh, holy festival where everybody in all sectors of society, including people who are so far apart in society that they would never talk to each other, are all sprinkling these colored pigments. 
and uh, it's it's uh, visually quite uh, arresting and so on. Uh, and those of you with more medical interests may be wondering whether this has any medical downside. And yes, it certainly does, because the brightly colored pigments, originally they all came from plants, so they were all non-toxic. But brightly colored pigments from plants are really hard to find, whereas paints and, and, and sort of uh, toxic compounds are brightly colored, much easier to find. So you know, eventually a lot, a lot of this stuff, um, what you're breathing in is, is uh, um, potentially toxic and it creates skin disease, lung disease, eye disease. Yeah, give you some idea of it. So may, maybe that could be a component, maybe not. Um, those of you who follow me on Facebook know there's a lot of poetry by, by me there, but it's the only poem by someone else that's on, on my Facebook page. It's called The Crayola Bomb. Maybe we should develop a Crayola Bomb as our next secret weapon, a happiness weapon, a beauty bomb. So every time a crisis developed, we'd launch one, explode high in the air, explode softly, send thousands, millions of little parachutes into the air, floating down to the earth, boxes of Crayolas. We wouldn't go cheap either. Boxes of 64 with a sharpener built right in with silver and gold and copper and magenta and peach and lime and amber and umber and all the rest. And the people would smile and get a funny look on their faces and cover the world with imagination. Now, if that doesn't do it for you, <clears throat> then if you have a Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner and you do a time-lapse photograph, you get something like this, eh? And then what about hot air balloons? It's uh, something I <laughs> fantasized about. Hot air balloons can give uh, similarly visually inspiring, colorful appearance. <clears throat> it can also be caught on, you know, electrical wires, catch fire, and, you know, people can perish in a hot air balloon. So, yeah, I don't know, uh, but it's, it's one way to think about this. Okay, so beyond the, the visuals, so if you think about the successful holidays, just the word of them, like Christmas, e Easter, whatever, brings to mind all sorts of things, not just visual, but like, uh, you know, ideas and, and, and uh, songs and poetry and uh, smells, you know, it, it, they, they engage all the human senses. So if, if we were going to do that with songs, what song would we pick? The windmills of your mind might be one round, like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning, on an ever spinning reel, like a snowball down a mountain or a carnival balloon, like a carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon, like a clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face and the world is like an apple whirling silently in space, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Now you may know that the High Level Bridge has had a Light the Bridge initiative. And this is a little bit like Future Day itself in that originally they thought they'd be booked way into the future People who, who, are, who have uh, good uh, humanitarian causes and you know, organizations doing good things would light the bridge in the colors of their organization. And you put in a pitch to light the bridge and stuff. But it's actually become remarkably easy. But one um, year we did it and our colors were green and orange. Some of you may know where that comes from. <laughs> the 
The Edmonton Journal article about the course contains two robots who have green and orange as their predominant colors. And the, the class that you all went to the bridge and you know experienced the color changes and that sort of thing. <coughs> so we did that in 2015. Yeah, and so there is what we were copying and that's the way the bridge looked that year. So your, section, your suggestions are greatly welcomed. How can we capture the imagination of the public to start everyone thinking about these matters? So it's sort of like the way I ended the first lecture, right? But, but, but now we're incorporating the idea of holiday. Maybe it's a non-starter. Maybe that is what we're, we're learning from the fact that actually fewer uh, cities celebrate uh, Future Day every year. But I, I just wanted to make you aware of, the, of what we've been doing with this and how it started. Uh, <clears throat> so um, it's something you could discuss and uh, yeah so okay now this is a required <laughs> slide not for you but for me that Marcus Hutter said we must have this slide and you guys must have the link to his slide set and so <clears throat> also David uh, Chambers analysis of the singularity uh, from the Journal of Consciousness studies yeah anyway so so these i i think this is the only lecture in the course maybe with references at the end like this but uh part of it is because i was using somebody else's slide set and this is marcus hutter's requirement for that okay so i'm going to stop sharing Okay, so any questions, discussion? We have exactly 20 minutes left. I have uh, several comments. So you mentioned that Marcus Hutter would say, said that the sound of singularity would be white noise. Yes. For the people experiencing it and also for, uh, for outsiders. No, just for outsiders. For insiders, you don't notice anything different because everybody around you is speeding up at the same rate. So it seems like normal life to you, but it's just for other people, it's normal life going on a lot faster, you know, a lot more happening per second or whatever for them. So it would be beneficial for the people that are experiencing it in a way. Maybe they won't be aware, but it would benefit the, the way in which they exist. I, I think an important part of this course is to realize that we are not passive victims of the future, right? We can help shape the future. Part of your incentive for taking this course would have been that maybe you feel that a little bit or subconsciously feel it. And so it is not intrinsically either headed toward utopian outcome or toward you know, apocalyptic outcome. It, it, we can shape which way it goes. And, and, and so a post-scarcity world of the kind that I you know, described last time, where all sorts of things that in, in as your life went along, you gave up the idea of ever having, you could have all those things in, in that, you know, utopian world. And then it, the future world of, you know, apocalyptic nature could be worse than your worst nightmare, right? I mean, they're all about the bad stuff that you have never conceptualized never thought about that, that could be a part of that world. And the, the extremeness of those two concepts are, are sort of counterbalancing, right? And the technology itself 
does not determine which way we go. I think human activity can help <laughs> push that one way or the other. Uh, but it, it is not intrinsically beneficial or, you know, adversely affecting people. It, it could go either way. And I mean, you can already see it, right? I mean, it, it, it's a part of your life. You know, if you look at the phone call records of your, on your phone, you know, just look at the phone calls. <clears throat> In the course of the years, more and more of your phone calls have been connecting to machines, right? And originally, that was horrible. It, it, it never worked and the machine could never understand you and so on. Now, generally, when you connect in a phone call to a machine, it is definitely more efficient and may actually get you what you're trying to get to quicker than if you had reached the human being, right? So that's something that, that in the beginning, no one believed that that was possible or could ever occur. So yeah, anyway, that, that's the deal. And uh, <clears throat> so can little people like us make a difference in the world? Yes, I, we, 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 we obviously can. There are millions of examples of that. I mean, so many examples, you never run out of, of them. When you start to list the examples of one person making a difference, it's still possible you guys can still do it. And, and it starts with believing that you can do it. That, that's the thing, that's the first step, right? And you know, <clears throat> uh, overcoming failure is, is an important part of life, gives you resilience and stuff. So you should you know, aspire to things, uh, test yourself, see what you can accomplish. <laughs> So some of those would be small local things, right? That don't impact the whole world, but you could also <clears throat> move the dial a little bit in terms of wh whether we're headed for a, a utopian or or an apocalyptic uh, world evolution. So yeah. I I also had another question. So you were talking about the virtual world, right? And how uh, you know we could have unlimited lives and so on. But does this virtual world require a physical location? Um, probably not in the, in the sense that one of the advantages, I mean, if you think about Star Trek, I, I've enjoyed Star Trek <laughs> over many years and it always seemed to me that that was a believable world, but <clears throat> If you look at the radiation of space and the changes that occur in the eye and all that sort of thing, even in short space flight, it, it, it doesn't appear that human beings as they are now can easily live that Star Trek life. So there are two other ways to do it. One is to specifically breed human beings that are you know, resistant to some of, some of the dangers, that maybe have sturdier eyes and, and, and you know, are resistant to radiation and so on. There's also, of course, the untested thing of uh, uh, reproduction in space. Does that work? I, I mean, no babies have been born, <laughs> born in space so we don't really know that it can't work but obviously that would be kind of a killer for the human race if we, we discover that we can only reproduce on earth uh, if in, in terms of, you know uh, biological world so um, mind uploading taking what makes you you all the wishes and aspirations and and, and, and goals and so on that you have and all the, the great thoughts that you've had and, and so on, <laughs> including the ones that maybe you can't remember right now because probably the memory function would work a lot 
better in, in, in these mind uploads, you would upload that essence of yourself. And how would you travel? You could presumably travel by the speed of light that you could put that basically you're now software right and you can be projected on some you know laser beam or something and travel at the speed that that laser beam into, into another physical space assuming that we reach the computronium yeah 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 like so I, I so you know. so i mean what one uh idea is you'd be in a ceramic slab, right? And you, you know, movies where there are uh, ceramic slabs with sense of humor and, and, you know, pretty smart ceramic slabs and so on. But I mean, that's that the, may, maybe you could be in uh, smart dust, you know, you don't have to be very big, you don't have to all, all of you be in one place. So Maybe it's it's not shiny and slab like at all what you're in, but yeah, I think there there would need to be some physical manifestation at the other end. And <clears throat> let me tell you what happened <laughs> with me and my seven-year-old granddaughter and uh, uh, Rebecca, who 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 is with us today. We did a, a video together about this. And uh, so it, it was very interesting thinking about the consequence on a seven-year-old child of this, you know? Um, like if it's really true that uh, this will be widespread and successful in 19 years, then as a maybe as a biological being, she'll never reach her 27th year because she'll decide to do mind uploading at the age of, you know, 26 when, when it becomes so fashionable that everybody's doing it, right? And a lot of famous people, their greatest utterances, their more most memorable lines, the the quotes that people uh, are, are talking about year after year were things they wrote at the age of 27. So she might, might never get there, right? So, so anyway, the whole, whole thing is, is uh, quite interesting to contemplate. And it has seemed to me that the reason that it won't happen in 19 years is not that it couldn't happen, but the same resistance all of you are now feeling to this, that, you know, I like my biological body. I can't think of anything that would convince me to, you know, to, to, to you know, upload my consciousness to a ceramic slab, and I ain't going to do that, right? So I think it's going to be a long time before that resistance among human beings is... Um, successfully overcome or another way to think about it if your interest is in medicine won't the psychiatric side effects of having an uploaded mind be almost uh you know an insurmountable medical problem in the first instances and you'd have two problems right the person is crazy because they can't be themselves when they're in the ceramic slab, never mind that they're now, you know, immortal and smarter than before and all that kind of stuff. They still don't like it, but they can't report not liking it because, you know, if, for instance, for the first uploaded human, the whole world's waiting and probably the pressure of every kind of pressure you can imagine for them to self-report that they're having just the greatest fun in their lives will be so much that you can't believe what they report back, you know? They say, it's great, all of you should join me. But that's because that was a scripted line that the people who put this whole scenario together told them they had to say, or else they were not gonna be the first upload, you know? So yeah, it, 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 it's uh, quite interesting to think of, how could you really tell whether people were, were enjoying themselves. And wouldn't it 
be possible to dial up any emotion you wished. So in that setting, where you can make yourself feel any way you want to feel, how do you determine whether some whether, whether you're happy or not? You know, when it's not external forces, but the settings you place on the dial of, of your own self-controlled emotions. Yeah, it's very interesting. I have a quick question, um, yeah. Dr. Smuz, around, uh, you mentioned the major epochs, um, and yeah. obviously the first five are sort of where we're at, and then <laughs> you mentioned, I'd probably ask about the universe waking up, and here I am asking about it, but I, I'm just actually really curious what that actually, what it looks like, because um, you mentioned that it's, so it's patterns of matter and energy in the universe becoming saturated with intelligence. Um, based on like your understanding, what tangibly could that look like and how close would we be to the, the sixth epoch? Yeah, well, I think the first thing would be that there would be changes in the night sky because there would be beings or entities that could control entire solar systems, focus all, all the energy of that solar system on some you know, creative enterprise, but that would change the way the night sky looks, right? And every now and then there, there are stars that have you know, artifacts in the way the light is coming from them that suggests that such a Dyson sphere or something like that has been created, you know, where they're capturing all the light from their sun and then doing something else with it. But um, all those things can be explained some other way. But that would become really common, I think, when the whole universe come, comes alive. So maybe it would be like the game of Go, when um, in uh, 2016, um, machine intelligence surpassed human intelligence, there were uh, beautiful patterns on the Go board that the you know, computer had created that no human had ever thought of, uh, you know, arranging a, uh, game of Go like that, or having the uh, playing pieces be in. So it would be something like that. You would look at the night sky, and rather than just these random things, <laughs> they, they, they would be, you know, in, in, in more, I think, recognizable patterns, and it would kind of all make sense, you know? Maybe the, the meaning of life the entire universe would be spelled out in some way. I don't know, but you could you could imagine that it would be obvious, right? And then with powerful telescopes, uh, we're able to see back to the beginning of time, right? So how would that work exactly? Presumably the stars that are closer to us would manifest more of this, even if it's taking place, I don't know, yeah. So uh, it, I don't think it would be uniform, the, 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 because if it all takes place at the same time, the light that we're seeing is light from, you know, thousands of years ago for some of those, Things so yeah, but presumably it would happen first locally in the planet and then in our solar system, rather than in the universe, right? Because uh, computronium, which is you define that the whole universe turns into computerized resources. Yeah, but so it 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 depends stuff, upon right? whether we are alone, right? Okay, and 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 so. If we are the only place in the universe that has life, if, if, if life is so incredibly rare that, you know, it, it's not just something that randomly appears, but you know, the chances of it appearing are practically zero. So this is the only place. So then there's the Fermi paradox. And it's important 
since I'm running this course, that you understand the relationship between the Fermi paradox and my reputation in the world, right? So the video I did about the Fermi paradox, suggesting that it's the sort of macho people in charge and the, the, those macho leaders killing each other off is the reason why aliens have never reached us and never gotten very far. And if you put women in charge, then these things could succeed. And that's the only video that I have with substantial numbers of thumbs down. And you can imagine those are men who are really, really, really offended with what I have to say there about the Fermi paradox. Um, so, so it's quite interesting. And uh, so then are, are there reasoned arguments about why I'm wrong there? Uh, no, I mean, people bringing up Margaret Thatcher, I mean, and, and stuff like that. I'm not saying that, that, that women are naturally morally superior to men, but they're less territorial. They're, they're less likely to, you know, like the idea of kind of getting rid of the people who are in charge of that, that whatever it is over there and taking it over. That seems to be more of a male leadership. Do you think that uh, with the assistance of uh, technological beings or, or algorithms, we could reach a point soon in which we can um, get over these conflicts that we have in our planet in a better way and then move on, move on as a yeah. species? Well, you you probably heard heard me talk about this a lot, but my idea is when if we massage things toward the utopian side, then this would mean that the machines that take over the world are acting in our interests. And you know, it's just great because they're able to accomplish things that human beings never can. One is male against male conflict, that if, if a man just tries to raise a hand against another man and fight breaks out, there's some unseen force that the machine brings there and it just, now, now, boys, <laughs> we don't want you doing that, you know? And plus, you know, the, the oxygen le level in the air goes up and the level of toxin stuff goes down, the, uh, global warming stops and, and the number of green things uh, increases greatly. You know, the world is much more beautiful because you've got more uh, happy plants around, you know, and, and yeah, and there are probably a lot of other problems we didn't even know that we had, like, you know, all the plastic in the ocean, I think that probably within very short order, the machines could figure out a way to like get rid of all of that. And other things that would make the, the oceans better. Then you have the whole thing again uh, about, uh, you know, animals and fish that kill other animals and fish. That's just the way it is, right? But it wouldn't necessarily, uh, if we could, uh, have systems where everything could obtain food without having to kill something else. I mean, that, that's a much larger <laughs> challenge than doing the things that people need, but uh, it, it is, you know, something at least worth considering. And then if, if we can increase our own intelligence, uh, you probably have, some of you have pets and stuff, you know, it might be interesting to be able to actually talk to your pet and find out what they, what they think of you after all, all these years and so on. And, you know, you, you can actually bring their intellect up where they could, you know, communicate with you. And, and so it's sort of like human enhancement. But, you know, I've talked about what a big challenge that is and there would be no end Right? I mean, you couldn't ever 
satisfy everybody's wish for human human enhancement, but you could enhance you could enhance the whole world. And I think you can immediately sense that's outside of what human beings can do and probably human beings would ever decide to do. But, you know, machines could possibly do that so that fish wouldn't have to live in fear of being eaten by other fish. You know? uh, that, that would be an amazing world. They could just enjoy their fishiness without, you know, ha having this constant fear of of uh, bad stuff happening. Uh, yeah. Hard topic to to think of. I don't yeah, know. It, it's. I it's, don't understand how how that would work. And in a way, that ties. Uh, so, by the way, there's the Zoom chat, and uh, people have been asking things. But actually, I you said I wonder if the physical world still exists but no living being is in it anymore. And that's when the... Yeah, well, see that, that, um, <clears throat> that would be one way of knowing that mind uploading really does work. I mean, if people don't just say that they enjoy it, but actually if everybody chooses it, it's, it's the same as what uh, Yuval Noah Harari saying about machine decision making. Mm -hmm. What he's saying is that in the future, when you have a big decision to make, what to do with your life, who, who to marry, where to live, you know, you would never make that decision yourself or ask another human being. You would always ask the sentient machine because it would have been shown by that time that the outcome is like a thousand fold better let the machine make that decision, right? So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, then the question is, where would the drama and the intrigue in human lives be? And <clears throat> I think it then becomes um, what prevents you from doing everything you aspire to is FOMO, right? The fear of missing out and the fact you can only be one place at one time. So if there are multiple instances of you, and if you had the, the uh, intellect to keep them all straight, so you wouldn't get mixed up, right? So like instant six is, you know, climbing Mount Everest, something you've always wanted to do, right? And instance five, Five is, is, you know, exploring the world under sea and that sort of thing. And they could all, you know, communicate with each other. And, and that would be very rewarding and something you could use this high intellect of the future for. Um, so, because at the moment, it's, it, it's not very clear the way the world runs now why would we need to be much, much smarter than we are now? It doesn't seem like we, it, it would be kind of wasted. But if we were leading multiple lives at once, uh, then I think that, that that would be a logical thing to use that extra intellect for. Yeah. Um, can I just make a comment really quickly? Sure. <laughs> um, is there a way that we can establish like how to ask questions? Because on Zoom meetings, it's really hard to just like put up your hand or like put it in the, like it's just, it's very like, I think a lot of us have stuff to say, but we don't really know how to like interject in the middle of other people talking. Sure. Well, no, I think like um, what I'm doing, I'm looking at gallery view with the chat open now, but I didn't open the chat until one one of you mentioned it. But I think if if I have chat open from the from the beginning, and if we have the, the other lecturers do that, then it then it would work better. Um, I don't think that there needs to be just one way to ask a question. Um, I just think that that uh, I need to be better at 
at dealing with chat than I was today. Um, so Maybe we can raise our hands like this. Yeah, sure. Because that way yeah. we would see it and it's like, oh, there's right. that person. Yeah, yeah. Because I talk a lot, so I should, I should just. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they, the numbers of us are small. You know, this is a big challenge in meetings of like 400 people. It is really, really hard to figure out how people should ask questions there. And you don't want a substantial proportion of people asking questions or kind of wrecks everything if you have 400 people asking questions. So, no, th this is manageable. It, it, it should work just fine for you to all ask as, as, as many questions as you want to. Um, yeah, and the other thing about it is that um, this idea of having the session go beyond the, the, the hour and, and 20 minutes, we've often dealt with that before. Um, and I feel nobody's obligated to stay, but also we don't have to cut off the Zoom right at three, three uh, right at, uh, 320. So, I mean, we, we can keep things going if it's obviously productive to do so. Um, yeah, and I mean, people who have to leave early, they, they can watch the end of the recording. So, you know, that, that's, yeah. So, I, I don't think that we need to do a lot of rule setting, I think you can raise your hand. And also you can ask a question on the chat. And I'll, I'll promise to look at the chat from the start of the discussion rather than later on. So does that sound like a plan to you guys? Yeah, yeah. it's like machine learning. We're learning how to, <laughs> to improve with a video conference. Era yeah, of yeah, code. yeah, yeah, sure. And I and I think things will vary. I mean, there will be times when some people can't be here, and times when other people are here. You know, Ishida uh, wasn't able to be here this week. She'll she'll be here next week, and and uh, so on. Yeah. So so it's no problem and like there was one person who left uh, so there were three people who left and left messages about while they were why they were leaving but that's fine yeah I mean you, you don't absolutely have to do that if it's uh, if it's uh, 320 and you leave you don't have to <laughs> excuse you can just leave uh, yeah so that that's also fine. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create a situation that's, you know, comfortable for the people here. And so to some extent, the solution should not be one imposed by me, but one that, you know, we come to through, through your input. So, uh, Ashley, does that sound like a reasonable plan to you? Or, or do you have other things to suggest no i i think it's okay i just like i don't know i needed to know if you were okay with people interjecting or, or like how you were what how you wanted this to go because right now it's <laughs> a very much like ask a question and then listen to you for a, an extended amount of time and then someone else asks a question so i didn't know if it was going to be yeah a conversation well see or no, no 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 the 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 best situation and i think we will get to that is where there are parts of the discussion, maybe more than half of it, where I'm simply facilitating. I, I'm in the background and you guys are talking to each other. I, I think that, that ends up with, with higher quality uh, you know, interaction in the end. So that's what I would like to see. And that's sort of what, if you look at the way the course evolved, as I said, in, fall of 2011, the 
and our discussions were all me and me and me and me and me. And <laughs> it just wasn't good. So, yeah, and, and then, then it gradually evolved to being truly it, interactive among the people in the audience. And so that is our ultimate intent and, and where people feel that they're sort of getting their chance to speak. I think that certain things like the content of this lecture, I, I obviously know more about because it's completely weird content, right? <laughs> it's something that the average human being would, would know nothing about Marcus Hutter and even less about Future Day, right? Know nothing about Future Day. So, whereas a lot of the other things we talk about, uh, even like, you know, regenerative medicine next time, there, there, you, you may actually know something substantial about it. So I think it'll be natural that there'll be more uh, conversation between students rather than just all me giving long answers to things. So yeah, no, it'll all it'll all come. I think you'll be happy with it in the end. So any um, other? I did have yeah. a comment about yeah. something you said a while ago. Right. Um, in that I know you said like a lot of people would be resistant about kind of like uploading themselves because um, they like their physical kind of being but a lot of maybe it's just from like my perspective but like a lot of people their own physical body doesn't really work for them anymore or like we lost Stephen Hawking because of his body right so there's right. a lot of things that like i think there is a lot of people that would rather i don't know if they'd rather be in a physical world but they'd rather not lose themselves right. because they're stuck in a physical body right well it, you some of you may have actually watched the the uh amazon prime uh uh program upload but that's sort of the situation there most people there um were dying in some sort of accident and and uh so their lives were prematurely ended but their minds were uploaded so one guy fell or jumped into the grand canyon you know sort of waving and smiling until it until until Silly at the bottom. I don't, I don't quite understand how you do it, but but anyway, that's that's one of the the uh, uh, characters in the show. Yeah. So no, you're right. But the prediction that Ray Kurzweil makes that this would be widespread and successful. This is not just people who've ended up in a situation where they're bodies don't completely work for them, but also people whose bodies are perfectly fine, who still would rather do this. That's the idea. Um, but maybe the first people to do it would be the, uh, people that have had these terrible accidents, maybe to volunteer for perfecting this. Because right. they already, well, maybe they will consider they have nothing to lose. Sure. But then I, I have a, a follow up question to that. Because um, do you think that in the end all the minds will converge into one, you know, collective mind? And if we do that, then who gets to, to upload themselves? Because, you know, potentially maybe we wouldn't want a psychopath uploading their minds into the yeah. Well, I think that, that it would be a heterogeneous hybrid situation if there's still uh, free will and if one can self-determine what you want to do. There were some people who would want to join the Borg, right? <laughs> because there's greater wisdom there, you know, the, uh, the associated uh, you know, intellect of all the other members of the board means that you know you can do amazing stuff but there are people who would not want that 
and so there would be, you know, refuseniks, whatever you want to call them. Maybe they would be the minority, but they still should be able to upload, but then not have to join the board. Um, okay. That's kind of how, how I... That, so, that's very complex. Yeah, yeah. So what, what, what about the psychopath? I, I imagine that one of the things would be that he realizes that he needs help and part of this help <laughs> involved fixing the way his mental processes work and then uploading him. So he's a former psychopath but not when he's on the slab, he's no, no longer a psychopath, but he has all these terrible memories from when his uh, you know, uh, biological body did all these horrible things. So, yeah. That's interesting. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's one way it could work. So, yeah. Okay. okay, well, maybe that's enough. So we've, we've, we've gone basically 20 minutes over, but that's fine. And uh, yeah, so we'll make a recording of this. So Monday's a holiday, but uh, Tuesday is my third lecture. And then Shauna's first lecture is on Thursday. And uh, you're, you're You'll like that a lot. I, I think she's a very uh, charismatic uh, young person that, uh, you know, you <laughs> think, what would that be like to be doing all that stuff? And how would it work? Yeah. So, so anyway, yeah. So, okay. and then lots of other interesting sessions after that. So. Okay, so I will see you on Tuesday. And thanks for today. Yeah, okay. Bye bye now. All right.